This video is really about the performance of uh, all of the other uh, avenues to invest in precious metals that are not precious metals, the derivatives, the stocks and uh, leveraged funds and, and uh, ETFs and so on. And so this is the Philadelphia Gold Mining Index uh, divided by the price of gold. And what it shows you is the performance uh, all through the late 80s and 90s, just sort of chopping sideways. And then the big bull market in precious metals starts. And the stocks, and these are some of the major uh, stocks in the United States, they're mostly hedged where they do, they sell future production and lock in a price today. And so that takes away from some of their future profits. And so they may not have a spectacular performance, but if you look at the loss, the way you read this, you know, you've got, uh, let's say 0.24 right here. Let's say you invest there instead of buying gold, you bought these stocks that are in this index. Well, uh, 0.12 is half that. So that means gold performed twice as well as the stocks. And uh, 0.06 is half that. So gold has, you know, roughly, I'm, I'm picking a, uh, I'm just making the math easy to do by picking these numbers, but we've been in this range of uh, 0.04 to 0.08. So 0 0.06, uh, gold has outperformed the Philadelphia Gold Mining Index by four, by 400 <laughs> percent since in, in this entire bull market. Uh, then we have the HUI is the smaller gold bugs index. Uh, this is smaller stocks and uh, mostly unhedged stocks. And there's some silver producers in here. And this one doesn't go back quite as far as the uh, the HUI as far as far as the XAU goes, the Philadelphia uh, mining index. But what you see here, uh, this was the beginning. Of the gold started moving in 1999 and then made a double bottom in 2001. And from that double bottom, there was this huge leverage that you got in stocks that went on for three years. Uh, from the end of 2000 to the end of 2003, roughly. And I was lucky enough to invest in a whole bunch of stocks in April of 2003, right about here. And I caught that last leg up where, gold, where, where the stocks were actually outperforming gold. And some of it was spectacular. Uh, and then uh, the stocks start, stopped outperforming gold. And I was wondering what was going on. Because when you buy a stock, you're introducing a bunch of risk. You're not just introducing leverage, but you're introducing risk. And the risk is you can have a mine collapse. You can have an EPA shut down. You can have, if it's in a, uh, your, the mine you've invested in is in a country that nationalizes the gold mines, you lose uh, the whole investment. The company can go bankrupt for a whole host of reasons. And uh, the precious metals themselves don't have any of that risk. But I mean, you look at the performance here and you're talking you know, about from uh, 0.6 uh, down to 0 0.125, 0 0.155. These are huge losses compared to what the physical metals that don't have any risk uh, offer. And so back in this area, I decided to do a study on it. And I don't have a chart handy. But here is one from Ronnie Stofferle, uh, and this is from Incrementum AG. These are some good guys. Uh, we'll probably do a follow-up on the uh, uh, interviews series that we did a little while back. But they've come out with their latest uh, uh, gold yearbook and chart book. And so I recommend taking a look at uh, their findings and their analysis of this. And what they're showing is that right now, uh, the stocks are very undervalued compared to the mean. But one of the things I also get out of this, and, and one of the things I really got out of it, was I did a study on, uh, I, I took the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which is the only index that goes back to the beginning of when, it goes way back to 1940 on this chart. Um, and it was the only index that goes back far enough to where you could compare the previous bull market in precious metals in the 70s. 70s. Remember that during all of this time here, gold was 35 bucks an ounce. It wasn't moving. This is just the stocks. And what I find amazing is you had this big bull market from 1961 to about 1967 in uh, the stocks 
compared to gold, and gold was still at, at but gold was starting to diverge on the on the open market, the free market. Uh, gold would go above the official central bank price of thirty-five dollars an ounce, and then every once in a while uh, during this period of it, there was something called the London Gold Pool. They'd dump a bunch of gold on the market to smash it down, but. In the bull market of the 19, from 1971 to 1980, uh, gold dramatically outperformed the stocks. Gold went from 35 to 873 dollars an ounce during this period of time, and the stocks in the Barron's Gold Mining Index did not keep up with gold. And uh, it's if you look at the um, levels here. Uh, this is probably something like, this is a logarithmic chart. So that's probably about four or five. So, uh, and then this went slightly under. So you might have uh, gold outperforming the stocks during this bull market by a factor of four or five or 600%. And when I did a study on it, uh, that was about here and somewhere in here. But uh, gold at this point, has outperformed the stock since 1971 by about 800%. Uh, so th when the uh, stocks are outperforming gold, they can offer tremendous leverage and you can make some really big gains. But if you're going to do that, get some professional advice. Uh, you know, contact the guys at Incrementum. Uh, Dave Morgan is a friend of mine of, of, of the morganreport.com for silver. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. But find somebody that studies this all the time and uh, sign up for their newsletter, get some advice. Robert Kiyosaki used to say investing is a team sport. So here's uh, GDX, which is another gold miners index. And you can see its dramatic plunge since the, this, is, this only goes back to 2006. If this could go back to the year 2000, you would see a much more dramatic plunge than this. This is the uh, GDXJ, which is the juniors. So uh, juniors are much more volatile. And, when you, and uh, if, if they win, they win big. If they lose, they lose big. But when you look at the ratios here, uh, they're way, way down. Now, this is an ETF. This is just GLD. So here, you're supposedly investing in gold. This is the biggest gold ETF that there is, exchange traded fund. So it's a trust. You're buying a share in a trust that is supposedly backed by gold. And that's what their prospectus says, that it's all backed by gold. Except this is the loss in value of that trust that's supposedly backed by gold uh, from its inception until today. And uh, this is a monthly chart to get rid of some of the noise because if you do daily, there's a lot of fluctuations. Now, if it was truly backed 100% by gold, it wouldn't have these daily or monthly fluctuations. This would just be a line with a straight line with their management fees slowly coming out of this and it would be descending. Those are mostly management fees. But the very fact that this bounces up and down and this is a monthly chart on a daily, uh, it's all over the place. And that means that they're using futures and options or something like that to try and achieve uh, a replication of the gold price for some of the, uh, you know, I don't know how much of it is uh, not actually backed, but I do know that it's not, I, I can state unequivocally that, um, that it is not 100% backed because you can short GLD. Uh, when you short a share of stock, what you're doing is you borrow shares from the broker and the broker doesn't actually have a bunch of shares. They, they just take them out of somebody's account, basically, because they've got a lot of people with shares. So you borrow shares, and then you sell them to somebody else, and now you're short. And if the price uh, goes down, you buy them back at a lower price and return them. So you're selling high and buying low instead of buying low and selling high. You achieve the same. There's profit there to be made. However, you own them. Somebody else borrows them and sells short to somebody else, and now two people own the same ounces. Uh, so uh, it's impossible. If you can short sell something, it's impossible that all of the shares are fully backed by gold. Uh, but this fluctuation shows uh, that there's something else going on there than just being a bunch of gold uh, you know, in a pile in some vault somewhere. This is SLV divided by the price of silver. So it's 
the, you know, if, if one share was worth uh, one ounce of silver, well, now it's worth uh, 0.891 ounces of silver. And if you had bought just silver, it would still be one ounce. Uh, this is, now we're getting into the leveraged funds. So this is velocity shares three times long. So this is supposed to give you triple the performance of whatever gold or silver do. And if gold goes up 1%, this goes up 3%. If it drops 1%, this drops 3%. However, if you do the math of just starting with a, a certain amount and you go, uh, if, if silver goes up 1% and this goes up plus 3, and then it goes back down 1%, and this goes minus 3, and you just replicate this day after day after day, you'll see that the math adds up into this uh, constant loss. There's this constant drag. Now, what I noticed was that the 2015 bottom in silver, that this fund was still way below it, and it's supposed to be triple the performance of silver. And then when I went and looked at silver, this is just silver, uh, it's significantly above its 2015 high. So I asked uh, my researcher chart maker, Alan Hibbard, to uh, do some charts on it, study it, and I wanted him to index that low back in uh, December of 2015. And so what we've done here is, this is uh, the triple silver, triple leveraged fund for silver, and then this is just the price of silver, and we've put them at uh, 100 here in, in December of 2015 at that low, and what you're measuring is the percentage change. And so if you had put $100 into silver and $100 into USLV, where you're supposed to get three times the performance of silver, uh, you'd have $127 right now of, sil of silver if you bought silver. If you bought the fund, you're sitting on a loss of $4. That's, uh, and this is supposed to be, uh, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a triple leverage fund. So this is supposed to be up at $181. Uh, is where the fund is supposed to be, but it's down at 66. If you look at just the difference here between uh, this and silver, uh, two times uh, 66 is 132, and this is just a breath away from that. In other words, silver offered you almost double the performance of this triple long leveraged fund that's supposed to give you triple the performance of silver. Uh, in other words, uh, this lost about 50%. Like, you know, if you go into the store and you're in the checkout line and you buy a candy bar and it's a buck and you come back a year later and you buy the same candy bar that weighs the same number of ounces and it's got the same ingredients and the, that candy bar is $2. Did the candy bar change or was it the dollar that changed? Is the dollar worth 50% less measured in candy bars <laughs> or is the candy bar uh, worth one did it cost 100 percent more measured in dollars uh you know you've got you've got to look at things from both angles uh so this is an enormous loss for a, a fund that's supposed to give you triple the leverage if you go back to the fund's inception and you put 100 bucks in it at its inception now this was in 2011 so this is just after silver put in its high of 48 dollars so it's down in the mid 30s somewhere. And if you bought $100 worth of silver back then, you'd be sitting on $49 worth of silver today. Um, you know, there's timing involved. I've just been buying uh, since 2003 on silver, 2002 on gold. I do a regular accumulation of it. And uh, I don't really uh, sell. I just accumulate until other things are telling me it's time to sell. But if you bought that triple leveraged fund, you'd be sitting on $1. Right now, you spent 100 and you're sitting on one. So it has lost 99% of its value. Now, in their prospectus, which most people don't read, it says that it's not uh, meant as a long-term investment vehicle. You really shouldn't hold it for more than a day. <laughs> so this is, if you're a day trader, jumping in and out of things, then go ahead and buy this thing. And there's also an inverse uh, fund where, um, if silver goes down 1%, it'll go up 3% and vice versa. So uh, if you're trading back and forth, you can trade back and forth between these types of leveraged funds and you can get somewhere, except most people that I know that trade end up losing. I just, I'm doing a, a long-term accumulation and when I get to the right point, I will be locking in profits, but I don't believe we're there yet. 
Basically, the story here, the moral of the story, I'm just sticking with the real thing. This is a chart of gold. And look at this beautiful, very symmetrical bowl pattern that we've got going on here. And we're near a double top. Uh, you know, we're doing a little bit of pullback today as I'm making this video. Uh, I've been hoping for a little bit more of a pullback uh, and because I want to take a little bit larger position. But the moral of the story is, this doesn't contain risk. And if you look at some of the modern storage options, you'll see that some companies, their, their storage is so inexpensive that you can add up all of those storage fees and it doesn't come to anything near what you're going to be paying in management fees and so on for some of those ETFs. I want to thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.